Folks, would you like to know what it's like to have a diverse career, an unconventional career? Join my next guest, Lynn Wood, as we explore being Ms. Diversity. Hi folks, welcome to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast by Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter. In this podcast, Gary shares everything about servant leadership, service leadership, authentic leadership, how to create high performance cultures, service excellence and life balance. Here's your host, Gary Ryan. Thank you, Sienna, for your lovely introduction. I really appreciate your work. Lynn, how are you doing? Really well. Thank you for joining us on the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. What on earth does it mean to have a portfolio career? Thank you very much for asking, Gary. I was one of the first to start adopting a portfolio career, in Australia at least, because I could see the benefits. And what is it? It's a career where you do different things. You're not actually aligned just to one company. Because I realised after a few years as an executive, going through all the challenges executives (laughs) experience, that life's not always great because all your risk is with one organisation. And what I found over my career was that your trust was decreasing in organization. So people Mm -hmm. who um, had long careers with one organization uh, were given retirement parties, you know, when I first started. Later, people were being told, we don't need you anymore. And people Mm -hmm. were being retrenched. I was actually one of the very first people as well to get retrenched in Australia. When I was quite young, I was, I thought, my program, I was in charge of marketing for an organization for a major retailer had an amazing um, program all, all planned. Uh, starting on the Monday, I was called into the managing director's office on a Friday uh, and thinking, oh, he's going to go over this wonderful program. I'd raised all the money from it, for it with the um, buyers. And instead of saying, this program's great, I'm really pleased that you're going ahead with it, he read me out a prepared statement saying the company had been taken over mm-hmm. and everyone was being fired, retrenched, uh, and I had to go and explain that to all my staff and read them a prepared statement. Now, that was a major shock then. Yes. M- major, major shock. So I also realised going through that experience that when they start taking the pop plants away, you start should start thinking about leaving. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they had been doing. Oh. So after that, and this is a part of my thing as well, I like to turn something really negative into a positive. Yes. After that, I decided to apply to do an MBA Mm -hmm. because my background was marketing and I didn't have financial experience. And I thought that experience showed me that the financial side was really important. I really needed to understand finance. So I went and uh, I did an MBA and I actually studied that merger. And I could understand why those two companies merged because, for example, straight away, I think my marketing budget was about at that stage, it was many years ago, 10 or $15 million. Mm-hmm. That was completely off the bottom line. Yep. Yes. Yeah, they saved all that money just by taking over all, everything I was doing. Only in the short term. Yeah, so, so I just realised over time, and that was the first experience, that's not a good idea to have all your eggs in one basket. Mm. And so that's when I thought, and also you've got five kids, I've got two, and I thought, I thought that uh, it would be good to be around a bit more for them. And I had the opportunity, instead of working with one company, to offer my services to other companies uh, in a basket. Yeah, so that's, that's how I developed a portfolio career. And it gave me lots of experience in many different areas. And yeah, right. <laughs> I was always going up a learning curve. And, and look, one of the key things that you, you did there um, through that, again, turning the positive out of the negative experience of the redundancy is, but you, you were able to have the courage to look at yourself and say, hey, Actually, the fact that this redundancy occurred and I, I got blindsided by it, I didn't really see it was, I didn't see the signs of, or, or even expect it. Um, now, maybe the fact when you get bought by another company, there's there's a flag straight away to be aware of the possibility because it tends to go one way or the other. We, we shoot up with further growth or we do re- restructure quite considerably, especially if they already had a marketing department of the parent company, for example. You know, being aware of that helps you to, make better, well, be informed mm-hmm. and make decisions. So your courage then to go and do an MBA, 
which is not a small endeavor, <laughs> it's a significant endeavor, but to close that gap of, of knowledge and understanding that you've, you've had. Now, as I understand with your career, the, the ripple effect that that's had with boards and including chair positions that you've had on boards has been significant because of that understanding about finance that you've got. And I guess irrespective of whether people choose to have a portfolio career or not, a, a big gap for a lot of people, a lot of employees, Lynn, is the fact that they really don't understand finance. They're, they're effectively financially illiterate yep. and therefore very much in the victim's position of things happening around them because they're not aware of it. And if you wouldn't mind just sharing some of the more, the, the ripple effect of you gaining that knowledge, and and then we, we I, I want to expand into innovation space, but just that understanding from a career development and the benefit you've had for your portfolio career, Lynn, around actually understanding finance. Oh, it's huge. It's really, really important. And I now credit my mother with helping me and putting me on that pump. Yes. Because... And um, when I was very young, she just gave me some shares. Yeah? Mm. And it was interesting having it just a parcel of shares because when I was at uni and uh, doing my first degree, it was a boom. It was a mining boom, actually. And I thought, oh, I've got these shares. So I can make more money by buying different shares and buying and selling. So when I was at, at university, I actually had stockbrokers. <laughs> And I was learning finance. Now, what happened was there was a boom. I was really excited about it. I made a lot of money, but then I lost it all. And <laughs> I went to the accountant and I wanted to claim my losses. He said, you can't claim your losses till you claim your, claim your, your gains and it all netted out. But it was a real learning experience about the share market. Yes. I didn't actually invest again until I joined a property trust and I was, felt I was safe <laughs> investing in property <laughs> through a managed fund. Fair enough. But I think it's really important for parents to tell their kids about, about saving money and spending money, not spending too much like all these, you know, these pay programs now that you just, which are the replacement for lay buyers. Um, people are spending too much. They don't then have enough money in retirement. Yes. And so you've got to plan. I've always thought you should plan long term because it's really important in life I believe, to be independent, to yes. not be independent initially, but you've got to build your life to achieve that. So then you can do what you want to do rather than what other people tell you to do. Yes, yes. And any money, it doesn't mean you've got to be super wealthy. I sometimes I wonder why some people just want to earn so much money, they can't even spend it in their lifetime, but just enough so you're covered. And that has to start, I believe, from an early age. So. Our kids, for example, are very aware of how much they spend, yes. how much they go into debt, how much they save. Yeah, it's, it's really it's a really important discipline. Absolutely, and and and, and how how they can actually be earning um, some money with their head on the pillow, even now at a young age, like that's yeah. possible. And and especially at a young age when they haven't got necessarily, in my case, they haven't got families or anything yet. They're still young and independent, and um, yeah, you know, we're we're really proud of how our children have taken that those lessons on board. But nonetheless, a lot of people aren't in the situation where their parents are teaching these things. They're not experiencing it. They're not learning as a result. And they're certainly not going and doing an MBA to, to close a financial <laughs> gap as well. Now, yeah, with, with the various boards that you've been on, so it's, it's one thing to, to, to look at your, your history of your portfolio career and see the boards you're, you're on, but how do you get onto it to be a chair of a board? How does that actually happen? Because you made it happen. Oh, that's a really good question. How? Uh, sometimes I'm just putting my hand up, yeah? Like they often say that <laughs> women don't like the confidence and I've always put my hand up, you know, like the guys do. So why wouldn't I? You know, I can do this. If you've got girls, I just always, yeah, always um, encourage putting a hand up and saying that you can do something because you might not have a hundred percent of the attributes but if you've got enough you can do it because it's, yeah it's, and if people are interested in listening to you it also comes back to a, one of your former um podcasts that i listened to which i thought was really interesting about the value of, of conversations yes how you talk to people like we're talking today yes yeah is really uh, important 
And I'm not perfect. Um, I'm always learning, as I said. I'm, I always think I should be better at this. And that's why I was listening to your podcast, yeah? Yes. Uh, because you've got to be continually reminded about how you talk to people because you don't have a lot of time with people. And uh, you have to, in, in some way, instill confidence that you can deal with situations, mainly conflict situations, because so many conflicts are happening. Yeah. So there's a couple of you, you relatively unique things about you there is, is in terms of, you know, during your career, it, it wasn't common for women to be putting their hand up and, and having a go, in, in your words before, like the men were, but you did it, right? Mm -hmm. You actually got the positions too. So the, you broke any myth that because of your gender, that couldn't happen. You put your hand up and it did happen. And as a result of it happening once, it happens twice, it happens three times, you know, and more in your career, because once you've got that record, just like anyone else, that record obviously spoke for itself and people kept on. I'm, I'm assuming, and please correct me if this is wrong, did, did you get to the situation where people were now tapping you on the shoulder to come and join their, their boards and services? Did that happen as well? Well, after a while, I didn't want to be on more boards. <laughs> yeah, my, my last position uh, was um, as a trustee or board member of the IFRS uh, mm -hmm. Foundation. And that was financial reporting, quite different from my initial marketing background. And it was international financial reporting. Uh, and it was representing Australia uh, on an international forum. And I used to travel a lot and with that, with, with that board and meet really, really interesting people. Mm. And I actually thought this is the best board I've ever been on. Yeah, I couldn't be chair of that. You know, I had um, I actually ended up being with a, with a uh, an Australian CEO that I'd recommended, who was fantastic. But I thought it's the best word because everybody was acting in the public interest. Yes. Uh, one of the things about any organisation that I don't like uh, is working in a team with people who are putting their own interest above mm. the national company or public interest. Yes. Yeah? And I loved it from that perspective. Yes. But at that stage, just the stage at which I decided to develop idea spies. Yes. Because traveling the world, seeing all these positive ideas on, around the world, then realizing that and everybody knows now, even more so, how the media is so incredibly negative. I thought people need to see these really positive ideas. Yes. And it came from a guide when I was traveling in Canada, who said, promote what you love rather than bash what you hate. Yes. And yes. I thought, we need to have a platform that shows this positive idea. All explained simply, it's sort of like a version of Twitter, 100 words, and a, a, a positive version of Facebook. Yeah? Yes. Anyway, so that's where I spent, I decided I didn't want any more positions. I would go full time developing that. Mm -hmm. And not to say that people weren't really um, tapping me on the shoulder, because that was a complete change in my. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, my, and look, the, the, the whole concept behind creating idea spies, which people can access through LinkedIn today, and there's, a, there's another version of it happening for Year 12 students uh, in New South Wales and spreading throughout Australia, as we'll talk about in a moment, Lynn. But we need innovation and, and we need ideas. And, and as you said, you know, um, <laughs> that your, your friend from Canada who's, who suggested to you, you know, promote what you love rather than what you hate. I mean, Simon Sinek talks about before something rather than against something, and 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 his suggestion for that probably came after you'd received that advice from your friend in Canada. So maybe your friend in Canada got that out first before even Simon Sinek did. Um, but but this is where you know um, I, I talk about feeding the beast, and and because we're mammals, we've still got this mammal brain, and on one level, our brain's still like a beast. But because it's so attracted to negativity and, and that attraction has protected us and enabled us to stay alive and, and procreate and, and dominate the world the way we have. So it has served a function. But in the modern world we've created with our brains, we've got so much negativity that unfortunately our brains attracted to, which is why the news and the media and advertising services use it so much. We need to know that and we need to positively put our brain in a space of feeding it positivity to get some balance mm -hmm. with how much negativity we're getting exposed to, which is why as soon as I saw Idea Spies on LinkedIn, I'm like, oh, this is, this. I love this. Like this is, this is, this is attuned to where I'm at. And I really am a strong advocate for people to be proactive because you have to be, you have to be proactive with whether it be listening to podcasts or what you're watching on YouTube and, and probably turning off the news, turning off reading newspapers. It's, you'll find out 
if there's a big storm coming, you'll find out. If there's been a big event with our energy, you'll find out. Uh, you know, the, the 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 world will let you know. You don't have to be getting all afraid about stuff that hasn't even happened yet. So, for you, what is an idea spot? Somebody who is very observant and who looks for those positive ideas uh, and wants to record them. Because yes. I was before idea spots, I was taking photographs of them uh, and thinking, "This is really great." Um, and I actually learned um, this sounds interesting from my daughter because I'm always learning as I said and she's really observant and I thought I'd love to have that skill and so having uh, idea spies you know coming up with that and, and developing it developed that skill in me yeah because you've got to look around you uh, not just at the negative stuff but also there's so many positive ideas happening which are answers and that's what we were sharing ideas that were solutions to a lot of the problems and I was really concerned that young kids today yes. are seeing all the negative news and thinking that I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> we <laughs> created this terrible world for them. This is not true. Yes. Um, and they can do something about it by doing things, as you say, turning off it. And more people are turning off. And you see our, now our government saying they should turn off the social media now. Facebook, for example, is being sued by many states in the US for the harm they're causing uh, to young children. Mm. Yeah in terms of the anxiety. It's very anxiety producing. It's all because before you used to be able to read articles when I was younger and they'd have two sides of the story. Now these algorithms are programmed to create anger. Yes. And they're actually, you know, like the nine to one anger. Yes. So that means that they're actually inflaming people, all people, not just kids, all people. And then what they do is they serve you up more of your own opinion, which yes. actually spins you, spins people to extremes. And when you can't get people to agree on things, that just becomes very, very um, you know, damaging to yes. a situation and to democracy. You can see what's happening. So I love being able to be an antidote, to do things that are an antidote to that. Um, I just love to have had more support. We had lots of supporters. We had 19 voluntary editors, advisory board with the very top people um, in innovation in Australia. But just because really could not get support for sharing positive ideas on a platform. But that's also because the major platforms have legislation in the US that favours them. Mm -hmm. That's not favourite such a platform in Australia. Uh, and I need more help for that. But anyway, thank you very much. I, the good outcome is that LinkedIn group, and I'm glad to see you in, as a member and your podcast is in there because That's obviously right. you're doing uh, really good work uh, in terms of the uh, knowledge that you were sharing. Yeah. And equally, you, you've taken, as you said earlier, right at the start, you said you've always taken with that redundancy, you, okay, what's the opportunity here? You've done exactly the same thing with Idea Spies and you are serving young people as a result. And uh, for folk, I can share uh, currently what Lynn's doing uh, with Idea Spy. So I'm going to pop this up on, on the screen for you all so you can see what exactly is happening with Idea Spies now. So, Lynn, do you want to just uh, spend a moment just to explain what Uprising is and how it's helping uh, students in year their VCE throughout New South Wales at the moment, but spreading throughout Australia and, and what we're seeing on the screen right now, please? Okay. When I started Idea Spies, I think about a couple of thousand ideas up there and a teacher contacted me because he had discovered it uh, and was referring it to his students uh, to uh, come up with ideas for their major pro project in design and technology for the HSC. So at that stage I said oh that's really great that you're using it as uh, a resource uh, as a library uh, for positive ideas that can inspire your kids but your kids can actually post their ideas and get comments on them from business and industry. And at that stage, Idea Spies was open to all, all to, to post. Uh, I later closed it down to only people who uh, actually put up ideas that um, were good. Uh, you know, a lot of junk started being put up like uh, on Facebook. Anyway, um, instead of just going back to his own classroom and saying that, he went to the Design and Tech Teachers Association for Australia. And they said, this is a great idea. Uh, and why don't you test it in New South Wales first? So we tested it in New South Wales on Idea Spice as a topic. Uh, and the kids 
who were in the program could put their ideas up and he organised that business and industry could uh, put up comments on which helped them with their project. Now, we did this for about two or three years on Idea Spires and he said, I want to expand this now around Australia. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic. And Idea Spires was still operating at that stage. So I developed uh, for him a subdomain of Idea Spires and yes. the subdomain is a white label. So it's, instead of like ideaspires.com, they, if they're putting it on uprising uh, dot ideaspies.com. Yes, yeah? which we can and put in the links. Like, I'll, I'll put that in the show links. Yeah, and so it, it it looks like his. If, if you could, can you go back to his site? Um, sure. Gary? Because what's really interesting, ideaspies is powering his idea. You can see it's part of a bigger program uh, that he has um, put on the web, but it's all based on the technology uh, that ideaspies has basically originally licensed, but now I'm just, he's just using it um, because I've given it to him <laughs> because yes. I think what he's doing is so terrific. And uh, it's got supporters. If Can you go to the partners? Yes, on so, there? so government partners. It's, it's, it's the government partners, uh, Good Design Australia, the AI group, that's the industry group, yep. uh, Australian yep. Architects. ITE is the New South Wales uh Teachers for Design Technology, their association, of course, you can see Idea Spice there. Yeah. Uh, so it's and principals, uh, great to see them there. Principals actually did all the on pro, all the design for Idea Spice. So all the branding for Idea Spice was done by principals. So they're all together supporting this program. And it's he stood up so the kids who want to come into this program uh, to put up their ideas. They actually have to get approval from their schools, from their teachers, and their parents. So that's yes, of course. Quite a complicated program to set up, but he's done it all, uh, which is fantastic. And he's, he's expanding it. But I figured that it's more likely he's going to get support for that. Yes. In a, in a specialized sense, because young kid, uh, than ideas buyers per se. Because what I was doing was perhaps a bit too ambitious. You know, like I was seeing, I was seeing ideas buyers as a, people compared it with Wikipedia. I was thinking of it as a new version. I was told initially when I was developing it, it could be a version, you know, a, not the same, but a similar type tack as TED Talks. So that's what I was imagining. Yes, but of course. Not what I imagined, but uh, now it's the LinkedIn group and it's uh, the uprising. So that's fine. You know. Yeah, which will pop both of those links into the show notes, folks, for you to go and check out because the, we do need places for ideas to spark ideas because that's also what happens with innovation. We get... I, ideas spark other ideas and, okay. and you build ideas upon each other. Anyone that's done any brainstorming session knows this to be true. Is, yeah. But we, we, we need to create a, a, a clear-minded environment where it's supported and you know that there literally is no bad idea because we're trying to spark ideas that are going to, in many cases, get implemented and turned into action because that's that's ultimately what we want with ideas. We need lots of ideas to end up with the ones that turn up into action. I still have faith that, and you're talking with a like-minded person, Lynn, about just keep aiming big, like shoot big. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of shooting big. And, and it, even if what we shoot big for doesn't eventually come into fruition, everything else we create along the way is worthwhile. It always is. And, and, if we weren't shooting big, we wouldn't create anything. So uprising wouldn't exist if you hadn't your shot big. That, you've expressed all of that very, very well, Gary. Because when you think about it, you know, people, a lot of people um, don't see the value in ideas. So I, it surprises me. Uh, different, it's a status quo type of thinking. Uh, and they, oh, ideas are a dime a dozen. You know that sort of um, opinion? Uh, whereas I think every innovation has an idea. At yes. Now, it might not be the original idea. That's correct. Because we all know about, you know, you pivot. And it's what I did often with ideas, but I pivoted, for example, I, I went, once went into a, um, a seminar when I was developing it, you know, they do those accelerator courses. And I tried to explain my grand vision. And people said, oh, <laughs> that's too, you're never going to be able to do that, right? And I said, what you should do is go into organizations and ask, where do ideas come from and how they rate it? Because you have the perfect model. Yeah. Mm. So oh, I thought that's a great idea. I love that idea. This is a practical, you know, like with uprising, a practical 
application of ideas fund. So I actually did a trial with KPMG. Okay. Uh, because they were sponsoring this course. And I was amazed. It worked so well within an organization because it used, and you've described in your previous um, podcast, it used the concept, you know, the practice of uh, psychological safety. Oh, yes. So people at all levels of the organization could put up their ideas and they could say who they were or not. It was about 50 50. And it was all explained simply, 100 words with formula. Uh, and I was so surprised at how how well it went. Yes. And accountants, and you often think accountants are not creative, but they were drawing pictures about things that they wanted to do. And um, anyway, so I, I couldn't get that across either. It worked successfully, but they KPMG have their own you know, proprietary site, so they yes. weren't going. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, to me to go to other organizations. Last organization I was sitting in, you know how you have to do a lot of research when you go and you know, you're pitching to an organization? A whole bunch of people who were sitting in the room and the innovation manager was really keen on this. And somebody in the room who was a senior person just said, why do we need ideas from staff anyway? Why do we need them? I just thought, this is it. I can't, I can't, I just cannot be going down this street. <laughs> I'm yeah. faced with decision makers like that. I, I can't. So I actually went off and I did lots of research mm. amongst employees to see whether they wanted tools like this. And it was clear that they did. Yes. And, right, and right. Other, other major organizations were providing it, but more like a checklist. So people could say, I've done this. I've, I've asked, I, this was very a very dedicated site that asked very clearly what your idea was in a certain topics. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, so that's all sitting on the shelf as well. <laughs> That's still all there. Um, and a very senior person who became the chair of our advisory board came to the presentation I did that showed how well it worked and said, you're absolutely right, Lynn. Um, your employees are the best source of innovation. And I thought, that's absolutely true. And why do people go, why do organisations go out to all these consultants at the employees? <laughs> and that's all come out now with the government, you know, you know, being burnt for going out to so many consultants, really, rather than using their own staff to look at ways of doing things better. Yeah, anyway, you can see I'm quite passionate about all these things. Ah, and that's why you were for many years the chief idea spy, first person <laughs> to call yourself that, right? And it's been wonderful exploring your portfolio career and I really want to thank you. I've got a final question for you. What does moving beyond good mean to you? Honestly, honestly, I just think we should be good. I, I look, I've read, read books like In Search of Excellence, uh, Good to Great. I also think there's something about going from great to good. Being You can be great at something, but are you really good? Are you good? Are you thinking about what's good for your organisation, for your country, for mm. the world? Yeah. Are you thinking about it? Are you picking up ideas that will do good? And that's why I got very passionate about it. And you can see the reason for that is because I'm so diversified. Excellence usually means excellent in some specific area. Being good is just good, being good across the board. Yes. And what I also heard you say there was for the greater good. Yes, yes. it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, for the greater good. And i um, more than happy for that to be part of what Moving Beyond Being Good moves. I want to thank you for your time and joining us on the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast, Lynn. Well, thank you very much for selecting me. I'm really honoured to be part of your program and well done. You, you, you run a really good conversation. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate your kind words. Now, folks, a big part of our conversation is about how to have high quality conversations. This is my number one Amazon Kindle bestseller, Disruption Leadership Matters, which was born out of um, some difficulties that I encountered with my business during the pandemic. So following what Lynn said earlier, I took a bad situation and turn it into an opportunity to actually write about the impact of the pandemic on leadership. The chapter I really want to focus on here for that book is chapter six, where I teach you about high quality conversations. And as Lynn was talking in our conversation about people saying, well, why would I want to have uh, ideas when they're in a really senior position? Now, that's a challenge about how the quality of the conversation is going on in that organisation. I'm a big advocate that the outputs that we're creating, our ability to innovate in an organization, our ability to identify ideas and then bring them to life and make them actionable is based in our capacity to have high quality conversations. And my bet is most folk in most organizations actually don't know how to do that. 
and one of the things I teach through Disruption Leadership Matters is a very simple but clear process about first recognizing what is the quality of this conversation and if it's not high enough, let's change it. And I can teach you techniques to be able to change it, which are in the book and also in the programs that I do. So we'll have links in the show notes for that too. So folks, welcome again for coming along to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. I'm Gary Ryan, your host from Organizations That Matter, and I look forward to the next episode. Bye.